we tell ourselves is going to be a continual loop of you can't do that. Not good enough. You suck at this. You cheated on that. Well, you're the kind of guy who, and we're going to loop on those stories and loop on those stories. And then our bodies have a, it, those stories have a chemical response. It's got the cortisol and the adrenaline and the dope and all the stuff. And then our body gets addicted to that and it tries to solve for that homeostasis, right? So we, it has a vested interest in keeping these loops going. And you've got to take ownership of these stories. This is what I was born into. What's a different way to do this? This is, this is the stories I was told. Are these true? These are the stories I tell myself. Really? And I got to challenge those stories. I got to acknowledge them so that I can be about writing new. Welcome my guest, Dr. John DeLooney. He is a national bestselling author, mental health and wellness expert, and the host of the Dr. John DeLooney Show. He holds two PhDs, one in counselor education and supervision, and another in higher education administration. Before joining Ramsey Solutions, John spent two decades working as a senior leader in multiple universities, a professor and a researcher and crisis responder. He is the author of the best-selling book, Redefining Anxiety, and welcomes his newest book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future. Now, as a Ramsey personality, he teaches people how to reclaim their lives from the madness of the modern world. Okay, so welcome to the show, Dr. John Deloney. I am so happy and honored to have you on the show. I know you have a killer podcast yourself, and just this topic we're going to go into today, I know is so, so important, and I love how you go really deep into subjects that a lot of people don't talk about, and so we're going to go a little deep, and we'll see where we go on this show, but uh, I know it's everything that everybody needs to hear today. <laughs> so thank, thank you for being on the show. I'm, I'm grateful for your hospitality. Thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. So I, as I just told you, I finished your newest book, which is Own Your Past, Change Your Future. And actually it's uh, going to be releasing, I think it's April 19th. So by the time this, com- time this comes out, uh, I believe it will already be out. So of course, grab it off the shelf. Uh, I read it in I would say, you know, a few days, but it was easy read and it was entertaining and also radically honest, which I think all of us near, need to hear honesty to actually be aware of the things we really need to change in our lives. Because if people keep on like sugarcoating things and making everything sound, you know, peachy keen as it is, <laughs> we'll never change. So look around. So, we are not peachy keen, right? Things are not. I awesome. know. To say the least. So I love your honesty. And of course, the cheekiness and the humor you add to it just makes it more fun. So thank, thank you. The, I, I've, the last two decades, I've worked in colleges and universities just as a nerd and as a researcher and just a goofball. And I've hung out with nerds and we all just do our nerdy nerd things. And it was important for me for this book to not be talking at people and not. There's a bunch of really great mental health, things, a bunch of great, great relationships. The world doesn't need another book where people are getting talked at. Mm. My goal here was to make it feel as though we're sitting over a chips and queso trying to figure it out. Um, I'm just a guy trying to figure it out too. Let's figure it out together. So that was the, that was the goal of the book. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think the same, like my intention was the, with this podcast was like, I'm on this journey with you too. We're ever evolving, ever growing as we should be. And we're all human. At the end of the day, we're learning. We didn't get this manual of how to live life, even though you've obviously learned so much through your journey and your expertise and also your degrees about mental health and wellness. And I know that's a lot of what you teach and how you've transitioned in your careers. So I know your previous book was called Redefining Anxiety, which was actually released in 2020. I have not read that book yet. I will definitely, I'm excited to read that book as well to hear all about anxiety. (laughs) Yeah, I'll make sure we send you. It's really, really short. Okay, so I could probably read it in like maybe a day or so. You can read it in 15 minutes. Amazing. Well, so that was released in 2020. And out of curiosity, this newest book, uh, Own Your Past, Change Your Future, was this something that birthed through the pandemic or was it always a book that you were determined to write because- 
of all the things you've learned through your journey? Well, we, so we wrote Redefining Anxiety. It is, I just popped off on the radio, on a radio show. And somebody, we kept getting calls about, hey, and what's wrong with my anxiety, my anxiety, my anxiety. And I finally said, hey, anxiety is not the problem. Anxiety is just a, a smoke alarm in your kitchen. That's, if, if your house is on fire and your alarm goes off, it doesn't do any good to climb up there and pull the batteries out. And it doesn't do any good to get a pillow and duct tape it around the alarm. Your house is still on fire. And when I said that, the co-host said, that's a book. You need to write that down because people have never heard that. And so, yeah, that was just me working with people for 20 years um, with their mental health and their challenges. And again, I, were, I was a dean of students and a, and a professor for years. And ultimately, my body quit on me. Like it, it said, I'm out. And it wasn't this big supernova, uh, ended up in rehab or, you know, went to jail. None of that. I didn't cheat on my wife. None of that kind of stuff. It was this low level burn a hole through you anxiety, this low level depression, this, this, I guess we just gain four or five pounds every year. I guess you just stop having sex as much as you did. I guess you just check the internet. I guess you just scroll. I guess it, I guess it's just this, the way this is and your back hurts and your knees hurt and your neck hurts. That's just kind of part of life. And I went down a rabbit hole. I ended up getting a second PhD in counseling. I, I had to figure out what happened to me, what's happening to my family, what's happening to my neighborhood, my community. And suddenly I realized, whoa, 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 whoa. We have created a world for ourselves that our bodies are not designed to live. In. And there is a better way to live that we can have peace. We can laugh. Again. We can be kind and we can, we can step up and do the things we need to do when we need to, but not how we have to live every second of every moment of our lives, right? And so it's a book about finding peace. It's a book about hope. I love that. And I think, so I know you focus a lot on stories and the reason why stories are so important because we live our lives by stories, either stories of the past, stories of the present, or even the future, actually. Yeah. So I think it's so great that you pull out that you are recognizing the certain things that were going on in your life. It's like, we condition ourselves to think this is normal. Like, oh, I'm 40. That's why I'm gaining weight. That's why I can't right. lose weight. Yeah. Like those stories we tell ourselves because they're formed by either the past of somebody telling us it or our relationships, or of course, those stories we make up to ourselves based on maybe childhood beliefs or memories. So let's go a little deep into that because, you know, well, you open up the book since I read your book. I, <laughs> again, I love everything you share, but you open right. the book with it, such a great story, like this metaphor of life, of these cracks and not seeing things for what they are and forming this belief around a story that we've just attached ourselves to. So can you kind of maybe talk about this metaphor and again, the awakening that you realize like something needs to change in my life, obviously, like I'm kind of spinning myself into a rabbit hole. Yeah. So at this, it, the book opens with a, a season of my life where by all metrics, we were crushing it. My wife was a researcher and professor and she was doing great. We'd been trying to have kids for years and it, we just hadn't been successful. And then all of a sudden, um, Hank was born, my son was born, came along and um, I was a, doing great professionally. I just finished a PhD in education. I thought I was, a, I was in a super annoying, I thought I was a fancy pants. And here's the thing, I was just doing what I was supposed to do. I went to college, I went to graduate school, I got the house, we got married, um, had a kid, I was all about how much money can I make? How can I get the next title? I'm the associate dean, not going to become the, I mean, I'm the assistant dean, not going to become associate dean, not going to move to the assistant vice president. I mean, it was just this, this game, right? And it was moving and hopping. And also in my day job, I was sitting with people who had made life altering decisions, right? They drank too much, and ended up in X, Y, or Z or so the person who's been assaulted, or I was the one calling parents and saying, hey, your kid's in ICU. You need to get in a plane and come, come quick. And then parents would end up sitting with me talking about their marriages and what's going on in their world. So I was trafficking. My job was in the challenges of other people. And I was leading big teams. I had you know millions and millions of dollars I was responsible. So it was a lot going on. And then I would go spend the evenings in a hospital sitting with a college student that we didn't know. Or a college student with a blood alcohol level of 0.45 and they were barely hanging on, right? So wild stuff. And my body said, I'm out. I'm out. And again, this isn't this, it's not a tale that ends in a fiery car wreck. It's one that if I just kept going would have ended the quiet desperation that most people their lives. 
right? It just turns into this whisper and this is just the way things go. And Netflix is happy to tell me the next series it thinks I will like. And Amazon is happy to tell me the next thing I probably want to buy. And we can just do life. Now. And um, at the time I became, uh, I now know I've got a couple of clinical diagnostics that are fun to play with, but um, I became fixated on the little cracks above my door. The, they're just the little settling cracks that every home in America has. And I begin to look on the, I begin to see it everywhere. It's like Gray Brene Brown says, um, what you go looking for in the world, you're sure to find, right? If you want to find people who hate you, you will find them. And if you want to find people who love you, you'll find them too. I became uni-focused, like pathologically focused on cracks around the doors and the floor, in the, in the foundation, outside. This, it was nothing. There was literally nothing. And I got obsessed with it. Hmm. And I began to call contractors and have people come over. It was, I was all, all the time like, hey, check this out. And they would say, hey, man. And, and a con here's the thing. When you're not okay, when you're not well, when your body's completely cooked, a contractor, a big old Texas contractor with a dip in his mouth and a mustache and his jacked up F-350 drive up and they come in and they look around. And then he says, hey, your house is good. Call me in a couple of years. When a Texas contractor won't take your money, there's nothing wrong. And my first thought was, he didn't see it. He didn't see it. It's crazy. Mm. Right. And wow. think about the last two years. Hey, man, uh, here's what we, way we need to respond to COVID. And how many people went, no, it's all going to get worse. Like, no, it's, it's, it's going right. to get worse. And whatever you believe, you found somebody to back that belief up for you. And now we're in a world where the, the scientific community has jumped on sides, whatever. So um, I just stopped being able to perceive. And at the same time, again, still going to work, still being a dad, still being a husband. My wife says it was like being married to a taser, like it was being married to a, a, like a, a hot stove. And mm -hmm. so she had to create a world where she could be safe and where she could, right? And so I feel that distance. I feel her pulling away. And so I try to bridge that gap with more chaos and more, ah, and ultimately I remember crawling around in my backyard one night looking for cracks and in the foundation. And I remember thinking, oh, this is when they would call me to come in and sit with the guy who had just. Oh my gosh. And I remember it was just this moment of clarity. I remember going, oh, I'm not okay. And here's the thing that I think is important for people that are listening. This was not a Hollywood moment. No music swelled. I didn't have this big, aha, and everything was better the next day. I was still super anxious. Still didn't sleep. I didn't. Um, I, I didn't instantly become a better husband or a better dad, right? That was that moment of clarity is step one of entering into, okay, you got a lot of work to do to get your life back. And it's a, it's a, it's a walk I'll be taking for the rest of my life. Yeah. I, I appreciate you sharing that story. How long ago was this just out of curiosity? Probably 10 years ago, 10, 11, so 12 years ago. Yeah. So I think that's one thing that people need to really know that it's not like, I think a lot of people search for the instant gratification or fix like they'll go to somebody like please help me like what's the steps guide me like this is you know I, I need help and it's really an ongoing journey it's not like immediate fix it's a continuous action you choose every day to do the work and that's why we're in this space right is it's right. it's not just like oh I arrived <laughs> right well and we there's no hacks for life we're not real right and the most frustrating thing about making good financial decisions is I have to make one every single day. The most frustrating thing about exercising is I can't, there's never going to be a workout I do on a Monday on the first day of, of, of a month that's going to buy me the rest of the month. I got to get up the next day. I got to get up the day after that. And um, there's a great theologian that says the worst thing about being a, a person of faith is that it's every single day. You got to mm -hmm. choose every day to, to make your choices, right? Or to, to live into who you say you're going to be. And that's just not the way the world's been presented to us over the last 25, 30, 40 years. It's, hey, we can take, we, we'll take that for you. We'll take this one for you. We'll take that one for you. You can just, we're just going to grease the wheels on this thing. And man, we've taken off everything and now we are completely untethered to reality. Yeah. Oh, that word untethered. <laughs> but uh, so talking about that, the realization that like first that radical awareness that, okay, something's not right. Obviously I'm getting these little whispers or these, you know, bricks upside my head as Oprah would like to call them. So first we need to take ownership of where we are at 
and obviously where we are not. And it's being radically honest with these stories, lies, limitations we tell ourselves, which you talk a lot about in the book. And you go into, there's several different ones. I think there's four different ones. The, what the somebody stories, else. Yeah, the stories you were born into, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, those are the ones that like, um, we're a family that doesn't believe in God. And so you just, that's the way you enter into the world that there's no God, right? And, or God loves you. There's this omnipotent being who just loves you and who's looking out for you. or there's this omnipotent being that is watching you. And if you screw up, he's going to torture you for eternity. And he can't wait to, st- if you smoke cigarettes, oh, my, you're right and see the bad words. So we're just born into this story. Mm-hmm. Or um, we don't drive cars like that. We're not fancy pants people like that. Not the Deloney's. We're these kind of people. Or the reverse. We would never drive that car. We have more class. And, right? So you're just born into these stories. Mm-hmm. And then there's the stories you're told. These are the ones that can either be explicit, like somebody tells you. Hey, you don't look pretty in that shirt. You should change. You want the boys to like you, right? And that story permeates your soul, right? Or it's the the implicit, the ones that you're not told, but that uncle tells you through his actions what he thinks about your, what he thinks about your value. Um, that person that that uses you, that goes past your boundaries, that assaults you, that fill in the blank, right? So we get these stories, and unfortunately, those stories become the stories we tell ourselves, right? And there's also the stories of the things we've done. We have participated in our own misery, right? And I know that's not cool to say, but we have made choices, all of us, that have not helped, right? And we can say it's because of this, but we have to take ownership of, I did this. I ate this. I went past this person's boundaries. I hit this person. I I participated. I cheated on this person, right? And all of those stories become the stories we tell ourselves. And our brain has a vested interest in keeping us alive and so we're going to focus on the things that can kill us, which gives us a bent towards focusing on negative. And these stories that we tell ourselves is going to be a continual loop of, you can't do that, not good enough. You suck at this. You cheated on that. Well, you're the kind of guy. Who, and we're going to loop on those stories and loop on those stories. And then our bodies have a, those stories have a chemical response. It's got the cortisol and the adrenaline and the dopamine, all the stuff. And then our body gets addicted to that and it tries to solve for that homeostasis, right? So we, it has a vested interest in keeping these loops going. And you've got to take ownership of these stories. This is what I was born into. What's a different way to do this? This is, this is the stories I was told. Are these true? These are the stories I tell myself. Really? And I got to challenge those stories. I got to acknowledge it so that I can be about writing new ones. Absolutely. I think that's one of my most powerful lessons I learned when I, was, I kept on like having relationships that didn't work out. And then finally, like, you know, brick upside my head. I'm like, okay, if, if nothing changes, nothing's going to change. And I'm the common denominator in all these relationships. <laughs> right. So if that be the case, what do I need to take responsibility for? And really everything <laughs> I need to be <laughs> responsible for everything. If I'm the common denominator, it doesn't mean like if somebody obviously abused you, beat you or whatever, that you're responsible for that behavior, but you are responsible responsible for how you proceed from there you know i i I think that's such an important call out as a culture we've um really landed on two main paths forward the chief chief path is you will always be the worst thing that ever happened you're always going to be a survivor of right that is that's your identity that is the tattoo on your soul is you survived x fill in the blank or you're the worst thing you've ever done you, you can build a thousand bridges, you can feed a million homeless people, but if you cheated once, you're a cheater. That guy cheats. He's a cheater. That's always going to be who you are. And when you are, when your identity is the worst thing you've ever done, then you have to have an external entity come in and save you. You have to have a government program. You have to have a thing, a group of people who come virtuously save you because you are only ever going to be this. And so the hard conversation that I haven't seen a lot of people willing to have is yes, they treated you differently because of the color of your skin and it was evil and it was wrong. And we're going to be about fixing. it. Yes. You were assaulted. Yes. You had experienced childhood trauma. Yes. Your dad left you. He just left. He said, I'd rather go be with her than with you. Those things happen. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to go to the mirror and say that hurt. I'm going to own those stories. And then this is the hard gritty question that we all have to ask ourselves and so what am i going to do and that's where most of us we don't even ask that question much less 
dig into that and begin to head that new direction. Yeah. Oh, what so What comes true. next. Right. And so if you were in like simple steps, because it, I mean, it sounds like it, it's more complex than this, but in simple steps of somebody really taking ownership of the, or recognizing those stories they have on this pattern loop, what would you say like the initial steps somebody should take to uncover those stories and then start to really like, you know, take the ownership and rewrite those stories? Um, in my life, I've benefited from two main practices. One is I have to know that when I get emotional about something, when I get fired up about something, when my body enters into a trauma response because it's a junk that happened to me when I was a kid, that I don't see things clearly. I have to be honest and look in the mirror about that. In reality, is none of us do. It's one of our brain's greatest functions is it doesn't want us asking the tiger at the front of the cave, are you a sweet tiger or a nice one? Are you a petting tiger? It just wants us to run, right? So it, it actually unhooks that part of our brain. It doesn't want us thinking about it. That's how a young boy in a dark alley will get shot holding a cell phone because it looked close enough. Our brains mm. trade speed for accuracy, right? And it's close enough. I'm going home. I'm going to be safe. And we end up making a terrible mistake. So I know that. And so I surround myself with people that I trust and that I love and cultivate those relationships. I'm intentional about them so that not if, but when I'm faced with hard moments, Somebody else can see what I'm experiencing from a different perspective and they know me and I can lean on them and say, hey, what do you think? And this isn't an internet poll, a social media poll, and this isn't blabbing to every person on the planet. This is three or four guys, men and women that I trust. And I'm stuck here. I'm going to talk through this. I need, I need your wisdom. And I can't see it on my own. The other one is I keep a small little journal. And again, it, I got my, my ruck my go ruck bag here. It's awesome. It's like military. It's tough and it's all cool. But inside of it is a $9 little journal that I put tough stickers on because it makes me feel hardcore. Um, but it's a stories journal. And when I have that flash in my mind, you suck at being a dad. Or, oh yeah, sure. Take that speaking engagement. You're never home. Good one. Kids will love that. I actually write that story. down. I get it out of my head so that I can look at it from a distance and I can stand evidence from it. Is this true? Mm -hmm. And when it's in my body, my body's about protecting me. When it's on paper and I can look at it, I can be objective. And if I can't be objective, I'm going to call somebody that I've, of, of a trusted, safe friend and say, hey, dude, what do you think about this? And often, <laughs> it sounds all Pollyanna. My buddy's response is like, dude, you're an idiot. Or, right. God almighty, you screwed this up. Right. So their feedback's not always pleasant. Right. Um, but it is clearer than the feedback I'm going to get. And yeah. so having a community and writing stuff down, that's been two ways that I can acknowledge these um, stories. Here's a, a magic moment. Think of these less as stories because that's hard to, to, to pierce, to, to, to unwind. Something. Think about how your body responds in certain situations. And that ends up being your. Be curious about how your body responds right? Um, that guy walks in and instantly your heart starts beating and your stomach gets that warmth in it. Maybe you don't have anxiety. Maybe your body remembers a guy that looks just like that, that hurts you. And it put a pin in that. And now it's sounding the alarms for you before you even think of them. Well, we've all been in that car with a group of people and we know I, sh I need to get out of this car. That's our body saying, I remember this story. I remember how this ends. Get out of the car. And I don't always have a story for that. I don't always in that moment, I can't, oh yeah, my dad got drunk one time and got in a wreck. I don't remember that. I need to listen to my body. And then I'm going to be curious. What's my body trying to protect me from? Uh, right. Or every time my wife tells me to pick my stuff up, I instantly get flooded with, oh yeah, but it, I've been working all day. That's just defense, right? I can be curious. Why is my body getting all angry? Mm -hmm. Oh, I told my wife I was more intentional about being positive present. Show up. It, it's shame, right? It's shame. And so I'm going to do that, right? I'm going to do that, right? So it's, it's being curious about your body. That is a great way to point us back. I love that you mentioned that and that curiosity. It's also getting to know yourself more, like understanding what are your triggers as, as you're kind of saying these feelings, they're, they're little triggers, if you want to say, as a common word used. What I love about this book is you do walk through questions for each type of story, like relationships and more about the stories you tell yourself, which I think is really good. So you have action steps in the book, which I love. It's like 
It's really easy questions, but it's, you know, something to journal about that people should do the work on. It's all about getting to know ourselves and taking that ownership of bettering ourselves to go where we want to go. You That's know? right. The, the, I get, I get asked all over the country, Hey, can you be our therapist or can you come be our coach or whatever? And I can't do that for everybody. So the goal with this book was we're sitting down having a drink and some chips and queso. Here's what I would tell you. And I would ask you, how much are you on your phone? Like, when's right. the last time you were intentional about how much sleep you got? How much sex are you and your wife having? How much, right? I'd, I would ask you some of these questions and it's just, they're just data points and they paint a picture of a plugged in intentional life or an unplugged out of control unintentional. Wow. Yes. I love that. And since you mentioned uh, one of the things was like bringing in a friend to kind of give an outside opinion of those things you tell yourself talking about this, because I think this is so important. One of the topics you talk about that again, not only a lot of people have talked about is this loneliness epidemic we're in and technology was supposedly trying to, you know, more means to connect us, but yet we're so much more disconnected in this world. And, you know, I'm relatively the same age as you. And so I really related to some of the things you shared in the story is like, how do you make new friends when you're 40 years old, you know, the worst. Yeah. And it's, it's really true. Like we don't think about that. We just work and we live our married life or, you know, take care of our family, but we don't think about how much these connections actually are depth detrimental for our health. So if you could kind of crystallize that and talk a little bit about that. Yeah, our we're just our bodies are co-regulated. They are designed to be in community in physical proximity to other people. That's just a full stop period at the end of that sentence. And we're not designed to live loans of lives of loneliness and isolation. And some of that can be architectural, right? We used to have front porches because we didn't have air conditioners and we had to wave at the neighbors and we just all kind of knew each other. Too. Now we had back, we had, then we went to back porches and now we just have no porches, right? And we used to go to concerts and why would I go pay $850 to sit on the front row when they will beam it into my 80 inch flat screen in my house in 4D? Why would I do that, right? Um, I used to go to sporting events. Why? I can drink my own beer on my couch <laughs> for free, right? ESPN just gives it to, right? So then you, and then you throw social media in there, you throw busyness in there. I don't have time because I'm, my, my time is so leveraged. If I have one hair out of place, my whole day dominoes down because I've, I've so tightly wound my schedule up that I do hair here. I do this here. I get to work just in time to get to this meeting so that I can get home just in time to get to this t-ball game. So I can go straight from there to the dance recital, to the math, math tutor. And then I can collapse in our bed and I can get up and do it again, right? So we've created these siloed, isolating lives. And then we've told people, you're all you need. And I love the great Terrence Real. Terry Real uh, says in the 60s and 70s, women got their voice. They found their voice. They were given their voice. Uh, actually, they weren't given it. Fought tooth and nail for it. And they got it. And then they were lied to. They were told, now that you've got this, you don't need and men were never told <laughs> they were just told just keep you keep doing you and now we have a collective train wreck we all collide and we're desperate and we're lonely and we're exhausted trying to solve these problems um and it's, i mean look around, right so and then you throw social media on top of all that right and we are have a thousand friends on the internet but i got nobody to help me change a tire in my driveway i got nobody to help me paint my bedroom wall and we've just disconnected that completely. And our brains are screaming at us because it knows that 5,000 years ago, if I'd woke up on the plains of Missouri and my tribe had left me, I was going to die. I was going to get eaten by something. I was going to get exposed and bugs were going to, I was going to die. And so our brains have alarm systems that say, hey, you're unplugged, you're unplugged, you're, and it just gets louder and louder and louder and louder. And we cover up the alarms. We just wallpaper over with another drink, another, another swipe right with more hours at work with another project with another fill in the blank we just are addicted and running bodies are trying to get our attention so we are a desperate lonely generation um here's a scary this came out in 2019 this is the journal of american medical association i thought this was going to be the study that sent the u.s ablaze like that really started to turn stuff around it came out of JAMA article, and it was that for the third year in a row, the average lifespan of a U.S. citizen had gone down for the third year in a row in the U.S. 
That's insanity. What's happening? And so I instantly was like, oh, politics and murder. Anyway, they call it diseases of despair, addiction, suicide, and organ disease failure, like hmm. heart attacks and liver disease. Essentially, we are lonelying ourselves to death. Long tail suicide, as Peter Atia calls it. We're just slowly suffocating out from under um, through Netflix. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we are so desperately lonely. And then COVID happened and then nobody thought about that journal article. Anymore. And now then what, what do we do there? We, we oh locked gosh, ourselves yeah. in our houses to try to save one another. Right. And here we are two and a half years later and we don't even know what day that we are trying to wake up at. And it is a mess. I'm an optimistic, hopeful guy. The sun comes up every morning, but this one's a mess. So if you could talk about how does somebody recultivate new friendships at, you know, our age, like what, what would you say to somebody, especially coming out of COVID, if you want to say the pandemic, uh, when we have gotten so used to being alone, if you want to say, and let's say somebody is really recognizing, listening to this, like, oh, I, I actually do feel a little lonely. And I know I personally feel that at times, because as you mentioned, I'm doing all the things and I, I, I'm, I'm juggling all the balls. Right. And so I feel the same thing. Sometimes I feel like I can't make time to hang out with friends. And so what would you say to that person that is feeling that way, or they want to reconnect with old friends or cultivate new ones? I think that's a multifaceted question. I think it's in my mind, identifying a friend as somebody that I can tell the bad stuff to the hard stuff, somebody I can tell the good stuff to. We have a culture where we hide the good stuff. You have somebody you can call and say, hey, I just got promoted. Hey, I, my daughter just got, the, got her part in the play. My son just, like, we don't have that. Hey, I just went another week without drinking. Just want to call and let you know. We don't have a culture that allows for positivity, for good stuff. Mm -hmm. I got to work on time four days in a row. My buddies would cheer for that one. Um, and do you have somebody that you can tell them the dark? Who hurts you, right? The, those dark stories. And then who's someone you share adventures with? Who's someone you trust, right? That you'll lean into life with. And we have to back up. When we were kids, we just all got dropped into a box. And they said, figure it out. We all got dumped into a kickball game and said, y'all kickball. Or y'all, all, there's a, this is the theater play and you're the puppet and you're the plant and you're the whatever, go make it happen. And then we went to high school, then we went to college. And then we got dumped into the real world. And it not only was... No, none of our tribe, none of our people, but they said, hey, it's every self. You got to kill the person ahead of you. Because, and the, by the way, the person behind you is trying to go. Right. And we are not designed to live that. Um, and so you have to recognize loneliness will kill you. It's worse than smoking for us. I think the physiology is when your body recognizes that you're lonely, it's like getting punched in the face, the cortisol expression. It's like um, smoking, I think it's 15 cigarettes was the last one I read. Wow. Um, smoke, uh, loneliness will kill you. And so when somebody tells me I don't have time, what I tell them is you don't have time enough. And again, that's one of those stories that, well, I've got to be at my kids everything. No, you don't. You're smothering your kid. You're using your kid as a prop because you're lonely. Your mm -hmm. kid's propping up your identity. Your kid is the one trying to hold your emotional self together. And that poor child can't hold it. Let your kid be with a babysitter and go hang out with your friends, right? My husband doesn't get, your husband's going to be fine. He can change diapers for God's sake. And if he doesn't know how, teach him, right? And I didn't know how, my wife taught me. And that's embarrassing. It is what it is. And now I know, right? So um, you have to reverse engineer your schedule to make time for connection with other people. Um, and then two important call outs. Your friends cannot be your kids unless they're like 22 or 25, then, then maybe. But when I hear parents say, no, oh, my 14 year old daughter, she's my best friend, or my son is my best friend. Children cannot carry the weight of adult friendships. They don't need to know about your sex lives. They don't need to know that we might lose the house, right? Kids can't carry that sort of existential weight and it, and it drowns them. And it's important to be close, intimate friends with your spouse, really big time. And it's important to not use your spouse as a trash bin. Most of us don't have any other people. And so we just tell all of the crappy things and the crappy people and the crappy experiences to our romantic partner and it buries them. Right. And then you just get into these relations, relational exchanges of, Oh yeah, this crappy happened to me. Oh yeah. Well, this crappy happened to me. And you just end up trading your sewage for theirs. And then you go about your day. That's just not a recipe yeah. for life. So you have to take a risk. You have to go first. You have to be vulnerable. You have to say, I'm sorry. You have to say, Hey, we're all going bowling. We're having retro time. Everybody come over to my house, bring half bottle of wine and bring your half eaten whatever's in your fridge. We're just going to figure it out. 
here's a card game, here's domino, whatever. I'm talking about basic human 101. Let's look at friendship as a skill that we don't have. And let's start practicing. Stop making everything dramatic. Let's practice friendship, practice boundaries, and let's just dive headfirst into it. We have to do it. Yeah, I agree. And I think Sorry, also, I talk a lot. I get I, soapbox for me, man. I, well, it's, it's so, so important, lonely. right? Yeah. I mean, all these topics are so important. Like I said, it's not really talked about and people don't think of the importance. I mean, I think I haven't even thought of the importance of that. And that's just me being radically honest with myself. But I think it's also important for parents listening to recognize this possibly happening to their kids because right. again, kids are addicted addicted because that's all they know, right? All they know is technology and to have the screen in front of them and they're addicted because it's meant to be addicting. And so I think, I think it's important for parents to recognize if this is possibly happening with their kids. And what would you say to those parents like that, you know, they, they're the parent, right? Until they're 18, they're, you're parenting them. So you are showing them the way. (laughs) So what would you say to the parent to, you know, send them their kids on the right path since we're we are learning all these things that are bad for us that means they're bad for them <laughs> so yeah, so um and i'm going to kind of go at parents a little bit just knowing that this is the pot talking to the kettle okay so when a seven-year-old when a parent tells me their seven-year-old's addicted to i always just stop them right there and say no they're not because a seven-year-old seven they can only have access to what you or your romantic partner is handing So if they're addicted to their iPad, take it away. They're addicted to junk food, stop buying, right? It's it's be a parent. Well, then they kick and they scream and they go, great. They're seven. They're supposed to. You're the adult, right? Um, And when you get into middle school and high school, I had this, this was, this is a recent thing. This is just me being vulnerable. Um, I'm pretty pathological. I'm just, I've seen the data. And I will not give my, my 12-year-old a loaded gun to carry around at school with it. And that's what a cell phone is. That's what open access to the internet, open access to one another, open access to chat features and all these apps. Their brains cannot handle it. And yet, my son, in a, in a tearful exchange with me, and we've got a pretty open relationship, he said, Dad, I understand that you make your whole career about don't give kids their phones. And he, it was very... 12 year old melodramatic, but it was also a lot of truth to it. And he said, um, I get it. And I get social media is not good for me. And dad, I have no one. And it hit me like a, like we, he's have a birthday coming up and nobody's coming and he's a cool kid and he's involved in sports. And he was at state this year and he's in the theater program. He's got a lot of people around him. And I had taken away, I have taken his communication device. He's not on any of the text threads where all the guys are going to go fishing or they're all going to so-and-so's birthday. He just doesn't have access to that. And when you and I grew up, we had a phone that was in the kitchen on the wall with this little, the little squirrely, you know, spirally cord, right? He doesn't have that. And so we have to come up with some ways that we aren't plugging kids into the matrix here, but also that they can communicate with their friends, that they can be, have some sort of back and forth. And it's just a messy, messy moment, but I'm going to, challenge parents to take control of the electronics in the house um here's an uncomfortable fact kids don't listen to adults they watch them they don't listen to what we say they don't listen to our lectures they don't listen to all our advice they watch us so i can say hey son you need to respect women you respect women you respect women great that's going one ear out the other he's watching how i treat his my wife how i treat his mother how i treat his sister how i treat the women that are that are my coworkers, that are my leaders at my operation, that are bringing us food at a restaurant. That's how I'm teaching my son how the right way to treat women. And so if you want to, your kids to get off electronics, get them out of your house. You get off of your electronics. You stop going home and turning the TV on and plopping on the couch. Go kick a soccer ball with your kid. Go play dominoes with your kid. Figure out ways to connect. And it's going to be painful reconnecting. And most of the time, it's magic. Kids are yes. desperate. For so if you will create an environment where they can connect, they will be all over. Uh, it's so important. This is talked about. And I think it's really like some parents might like cringe when they hear it because they know. It's I the cringe. Truth. I cringe. I hate it. I just want to yeah. watch TV when I get home. I do. I <laughs> well, love you know Instagram. What, and you know I got to get off. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You share that story of your 
your kid saying to you, he's 12 and he's telling you that that's the way I connect with my friends. And I, I actually remember this story exactly happening to my boyfriend and his daughter that's 12. That's exactly what she says. Like when he wants to say like, get off your phone or whatever, she's like, but that's the only way I connect to my friends. And so it is kind of like a fine line. What do you do in that case? But I think there should be boundaries. Like absolute big time, no phone at the table. Yep. you know, after seven or yeah, after seven, no phone, like, that's right. and because kids are not even sleeping these days, that's another that's right. big topic, but. And the phone think, stays in my house and you don't take the phone in your bedroom and shut the door. And you, and I know this makes me sound like a 14th century puritanical tyrant, but um, if you've sat with the kids who've been chased down by predators, if you've sat with the mothers whose kids are no longer alive and they hug you so tight, you can't breathe. If you sit in these situations long enough, you realize, I don't care what game you're playing. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Go to sleep. Yeah. Hang out with the family. Hang out with us. And then I had a buddy. Um, he's a CIO of a fancy pants company, and he was on the board at Apple and Google for a season. He's a brilliant guy. He's hilarious. He wears cowboy boots. He's just the best. And he calls me one day a few years ago, and he goes, all right, Deloney, I got rid of all my screens, and now me and my three daughters are sitting in the living room staring at each other. What do I do now? <laughs> And so there is some, I got to practice humanity. I got to get these, I got to, you know, I got to get online or buy these questions for humans cards. I got to figure out how to have conversations again. We're just going to go for walks and I'm going to learn how to be awkward and ask questions again. This is a skill we have to just repick up. And I know it's so much easier to scroll and scroll and scroll, but please, for the sake of your children in our neighborhoods, let's reconnect with one another. So important. I really think people need to hear that. And that's, that's with other humans too, adults yes. as well. Like, I, I know you talk about like, go adventure, say yes to things. Like, say yes, things. just say yes. I yes. agree. Get in nature, y'all go play. <laughs> go <laughs> like, play, go have silly time. If yeah. I have a couple of rules when my first thought is, nah, I just want to go to bed. I have to do it. I'll actually be like, ah, oh, man. And I say yes way too often. And we, I know we have a culture now of like, boundaries and no and i get all that it's important we're overextended most of us are overextended trying to run from shame or trying to achieve our way to peace or trying to achieve our way to mom and dad calling us out of the blue and saying hey we never told you we're proud of you that call is never going to come most of us are not overextended with our close friend we're not overextended on adventure we're not overextended helping somebody move mm -hmm. say yes to those things and say no to the other yeah Okay, so important. So I would love to talk on because I think this is uh, two important things you mentioned in the book, and that's trauma and grief. Nobody likes to talk about trauma and grief, but these are important because they need to be recognized as this is what holds you back and you stay in the past opposed to owning your future, right? These two main things. And I think uh, we could talk about trauma or, or grief first, but one thing I've learned with grief as I've had somebody talk on my podcast about it, uh, Coop Blackson, I don't know if you know him, but he has uh, the magic of surrender and surrender, letting go and grieving is, is things that a lot of people don't practice in their life. And the important thing that I learned about grief as I recently endured probably the hardest moments of my life is losing my dog that I was extremely close with. Uh, he taught, he shared that we must feel all feelings, like all feelings must be felt to fully release from your body. We talk about like, or you shared in the book, your body keeps score. So that, that grief gets stuck in your body. If you never process it, if you don't feel all the feelings. And I think so many people don't know how to move through grief to actually honor what grief is there to teach us. So I, I would love if you could talk a little about that and why, why, because you did have a whole chapter on I think you called it um, aware. Oh, what was it called? Good grief. Yeah, I think that's it's. May, they may have changed the title on me. The working title of that chapter was "Good Grief." Okay, um, I think it was uh, one of the steps. Your second step. Uh, oh yeah, owning owning reality. Yes. Yes. I've got to just. I have to look in the mirror and or sit around with a group of friends, and I have to exhale. Say, my dad should have said he loved me. Mm. My uncle shouldn't have abused me. I have to own. That. That person should not have treated me differently just because of the color of my skin. I have to sit. Right. And it is heavy. And we have a culture that has pathologized any negative feeling. Um, we solve for comfort 
which is great. I love air conditioning. I love, you know, my microwave. I love ready mix, ready whip. Oh, I love ready whip, right? I like all those things and they're cool and they're quick and they're great. But in the process, we have, in the process of trying to solve for comfort, of trying to get more comfortable things and get faster things and smoother things and sleeker and sexier things, we've made any negative feelings bad, something to be solved, something to skip over. And so the number of students I've had over my career who would come in and say, hey, I'm really depressed. My dad just moved out on my mom. I would stop him and say, whoa, whoa, you're not depressed. You're sad. And you're supposed to be sad. Your heart is broken because your dad bailed on you and your mom. Like, we got to just own that. It's not, we're not going to pass it off to a diagnosis. We're not going to pass. Hard, right? Your dog, that dog who curls up and knows you. Your that dog knows you. He's gone, right? And I got to sit in it. And it's heavy and it's ugly and it's messy. And you can't do grief alone. The great David Kessler says, Grief demands a witness. I got to say it out loud and I got to be in the presence of other people. Mm. And our bodies go, okay, there's a tribe. We're good. And it literally begins to heal. And in our culture now, you get, you know, a immediate family member dies, you get three days. And then right. you'll be back here in, in, at work. And if your grandmother dies or your cousin dies, if you've got some vacation, you can take it. That's fine. If you're an hourly worker, you just have to do the math and see if you can afford to grieve. And that's just the way our culture deals. And it's, it's, it's killing us, killing us. So our bodies have a process for grief and we've got to let our body whew, grieve. And by the way, you still got to eat. You still got to sleep. And those are hard. And that's why you have other people walk alongside you. Um, when it comes to trauma, trauma is one of these words that's become a buzzword and it's all cute. And it's like trauma, trauma, trauma. Um, I think everybody's there. And it could be... The analogy I use in the book is everybody's got a backpack that we carry and the car wreck, the, I'm so sorry to inform you, your dad's had a heart attack and he died. Um, the divorce when you were a kid, those are cinder blocks in your backpack. You're a veteran coming back and you watched your buddies get blown up. Those are cinder blocks in your backpack that you're physiologically carrying around. They're not quote unquote all in your head. Your body is pulsing with these chemicals. It's keeping, it's keeping your body upright. But there's also cumulative trauma, secondary trauma. Cumulative trauma may not be a cinder block. It may be your mom, um, I don't know, you're a little boy and you're running through the living room and you bang your head and your, your dad looks at you and says, get up, that didn't hurt, get up. And you're four and you think, well, it did hurt, but he's smart and he's bigger than me. I want to be like him. And in that moment, that's the moment I outsource how I feel to somebody. else. I can't trust my body because it feels like I hurt, but he says it doesn't. So I'm just going to go with him. And that's a pebble in your backpack and a pebble in your backpack. And you don't want to, you don't want to be a teacher. You want to be a doctor. Go, so you're majoring in medicine. Okay. Yes, sir. Hey, you don't, you need to make sure everybody, your job is to make sure everybody. Okay. You're that woman who's a peacekeeper. Your job is to make sure nobody gets. You're the little kid who's responsible for making sure mom doesn't fly off the handle, which suddenly, you know, you're the child responsible for the weight of your mother's emotional response. You, those, it's a pebble in your backpack, a pebble, a pebble. And over time in our backpacks, that weight of the cinder block or 30 years of pebbles, the weight is the same. And our bodies are carrying that and it's exhausting, physically exhausting. And our necks hurt and our backs hurt and our stomachs hurt. And I literally can't get out of bed and put my feet on the floor because I'm, when I get up in the morning, it's, I'm carrying this stuff. And that's when the, the, the link in the book is trauma. These bricks are stories. And I have to begin to take them out and look at them and say, I'm not carrying this. Yeah. I'm not carrying the weight gain. I'm not carrying the fact that my dad used to call me this little fat kid. I'm not carrying the fact that I was with somebody one time and they abused me. They were ugly. I'm not carrying this stuff anymore. And I'm going to be about setting this trauma down. Cool. Yeah, it's so important. Uh, you know, that's where we really take charge of our life. Like it, 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 we have to be willing to like look at things and it's going to be painful. Of course, resurfacing trauma. Nobody wants to do that. Again, brain tries to keep us safe no matter what. Right. But if we want to change our life, we have to do these steps that are uncomfortable. That's the only way to grow is through uncomfortness. So you talk about those five steps and I know, so the first half of the book is really like 
breaking down everything, like what is holding us back in the past, which is really great to recognize. And then the second half is the actual solutions. And as we talked about early on, that it's not like a one and done, this is the steps you do it, but these are like the the tools that you have to implement in your life every day. You get to choose to implement in your life every day. And and two of those to add on. So we talked about uh, owning your stories. Uh, We talked about acknowledging and uh, looking at the past traumas and our grief, and then uh, choosing our thoughts and our actions. I'm trying to think of the ones I'm missing, but those are the connected there. Yeah. Yeah. And then the connection we talked about. Yeah. Yeah, And then you got to get connected and then the daily practice, right. Is to stay in community, to stay in connection, to say, I'm sorry, to say, Hey, you really pissed me off to say, Hey, that hurt. That joke's not funny. Like, right. I'm going to, I'm going to do these things to stay in connection with. Um, and then I've got to be about changing my thoughts, changing my actions. I've got to be about this for the rest. I've got to constantly be monitoring my thoughts. This morning, I, it is Friday when we're recording this. I'm tired. I did not want to go to the <laughs> gym. I didn't feel like it. And I got up and I did it. And it was almost an automated, I'm not thinking about it. I'm not going to feel it because I tell you what, <laughs> I'm not going to feel like doing it. This wasn't about monitoring my thoughts and how does my heart feel? No, this is about get off your butt and go exercise. And so I've got to change my action. And then some days I have to, I'm in robot mode and I'm getting up and I feel my body and I have to override robot mode and say, no, 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 you're going back. Mm -hmm. Today's not that. And those are rare, but those are important, right? And I've got to monitor my thoughts. If I choose to meditate on the most negative, awful stuff, and I just loop and loop and loop, or I have those imaginary conversations with people that I'll never have in real life, right? If I see him, I'm just going to tell him, you're not, you're never going to, you're never going to do that. It will never happen. So I'm going to stop with those thoughts and I'm going to start thinking about things that are going to be more fruitful. Rumination feels like good thinking. It's not, it's a waste. I'm going to start having more fruitful conversations with myself. I'm going to start thinking about more positive things, more action oriented things. How can I serve? How can I be of support and value here? Or I'm just going to sit on my porch and be bored. Just be bored for a little while. Give your brain a break. Uh, and I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. This is our life practice, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And it's, I mean, really when it sums it up, this is all a choice, but if you really don't want to live this uncomfortable, uneasy, depressing, if you want to say, I hate to like make it so dramatic, but if you want to say unfulfilled life, take a look at where you're at, see where you want to go. And now you got to close the gap. And that really what you share in the book is simply that is really closing the gap and choosing every day a better life like what you see for yourself. And it is being disciplined. It is maybe uncomfortable, but again, what's more uncomfortable than being un, like unfulfilled? There's nothing yeah, worse there's than that. A, I heard this recently. Being 100 pounds overweight is really hard. And losing 100 pounds is really hard. And so the goal isn't trying to find ways to not have life be hard. The goal is you're going to choose a hard. Which one do you want to choose? Yes, and that's true. That's, that's the, it's in my marriage. Marriage is hard. Being unplugged and, and my body reacting to, I'm not connected to my wife. Um, it's hard. And leaning in and doing what I can every day to meet her needs and to make her, give her an opportunity to be well by leaning into the ways I can support and love and care for her. That's hard too. It's exhausting. It's boring. It's not fun. I get to pick which one of those I want to do, right? And so choose your heart. And Choose the one that's going to give you a life, let you go. So it gives you a life of peace. Mm. Well, that pretty much is a great way to wrap up the episode. I could ask you so much more, but I want to honor your time. So of course, the book will be in the show notes, Own Your Past, Change Your Future, and also include his previous book, Redefining Anxiety. We didn't even touch on anxiety, which is an important subject, but y'all just read this book, go deep, and uh, of course, learn some more from John DeLooney. And uh, I wanted to ask you, because I always close off with the last question, which I kind of give you a little taste of what that is. So if you were to share a piece of wisdom you've learned in your journey, your journey of life, a life lesson that you just feel is so profound that you want to share it with others, what would that be? When I was 16 years old, I, was, I got a job at Burger King. That was my first big boy job that wasn't like mowing lawns. And 
I learned in short order as a 16 year old kid and I didn't have the words to it, but now I do. It takes 10 to 15 seconds to make somebody's day. And it takes 10 or 15 seconds to ruin somebody's day. Just by how I choose to enter or not enter their space. So be kind to everyone. Be kind to everyone. My dad was a homicide detective and the stories in the precinct was how he was kind even to the worst of the worst. Be kind to everyone because you never know what wars people are fighting. Oh, yes. Oh, that's so true. Oh my gosh. Yes. Humanity right there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. John DeLooney. And if you could share your, where people could, mo- bo- bleh, <laughs> where people could best find you. Oh yeah, sure. On the internet. So you can find, you can follow me at John DeLoney and you can go to John DeLoney.com for my book, and all the, all the stuff. And what's your podcast again? It's, it's, man, we spent hours and hours with a lot of <laughs> brilliant people to come up with the Dr. John Deloney show. <laughs> it's so Ta-da. lame, but that's what it's called. So. No, it's perfect. It's perfect. Well, thank you so much. Honestly, everything you're sharing. And uh, obviously it's based on your experience with so many years talking to so many people in the depths of trauma, despair. And through that, you've obviously gained a lot of humanity to help others uh, overcome their their struggles. And it's really important, especially in the time today, everybody get connected, tune in to more of this, of how we could choose to live a better life. I think it's so, so important. So thank you so much, John. I so deeply appreciate your time and for everything. I'm really grateful for you. Y'all have fun in LA and we'll see you soon. Perfect. You too. Take care. (laughs) 